We have um, a lineup of incredible speakers for this um, plenary session, and I am not going to waste any of your time. I'm just going to invite our first speaker, who is Liz Stokoe. And Liz is a professor of social interaction in the, social, in the School of Social Sciences at Loughborough University. Uh, Liz uses conversation analysis to understand how talk works. And she is also the author of a book called Talk, The Science of Conversation. Let's welcome Liz. Hello. Good. <laughs> Everyone thinks communication is very, very important. Right up until the moment that we want to take it seriously enough to study scientifically. And that's what I do. So I've got four take home messages for this talk. And the first one is here. To understand talk, we need to study real talk. Live, unfolding, in the wild interaction. Not simulated talk not experimentally produced talk, and not post hoc accounts of people talking about their talk, real talk. So what is it that I do as a conversation analyst? For those of you who don't know what that is, this is what I do. I collect recordings, sometimes single cases, tens, hundreds, thousands of recordings of encounters of the same type. I transcribe them in a lot of fine-grained forensic linguistic detail. And then my job is to identify all of the component activities that comprise complete encounters from the moment they start, walking into the doctor's surgery, all the way through to the moment the date ends. So that is my job. And I'm going to show you some examples of the kinds of uh, conversations that I study. And I also want you to imagine any encounter that you have as having an architecture to it, um, or a landscape, or a kind of road map, and it unfolds in front of you, and you're not quite sure where it's going to go. So here is a, a conversation, a really easy conversation, between two friends, Hyla and Nancy, and they're just going to start a conversation on the phone. And to be honest, if you don't manage to follow this conversation, I do worry about your life as having any conversations with anybody, and if you don't get this, then see me at the break. So here is Hyla and Nancy starting their conversation. Hello. Hi. Hi. How are you? Fine. How are you? Okay, nothing hard, nothing difficult to understand in that one. Just one thing to notice about this, and that is that their turns are rapid. So you will have heard them moving swiftly along the road in this unfolding sequence of actions where they both greet each other and they produce these reciprocal greetings and how are you's and they recognize each other. And this is moving rapidly. Okay, so there's an easy one to start with, but let's have a look at something a bit more serious. So here are just two turns that we're going to dig into a little bit later. This time between a police crisis negotiator talking to a suicidal person in crisis. And their job is to get the person to talk. Can we talk about how you are? No, I don't want to talk. So we'll come back to that one later, because of course in crisis negotiation, the whole point, the only resource the negotiator has is keeping the person in crisis taking turns and keeping alive by, by taking turns. And then maybe something a little bit closer to your world, which is um, neonatal intensive care. So here are two turns in neonatal intensive care decision-making. So we're going to come back to think about what was it that generated that turn to come out of the mouth of this mother. And the reason that I haven't shown you what initiated that particular turn is because I want you to think about that, that turn there that you're telling me to kill my baby, basically, might not have happened if the thing that came before it didn't pop out of the doctor's mouth. And so to understand that talk works this way in this unfolding into the future, turn after turn after turn after turn, and it's much more systematic than we think. So take home message number one. If you want to understand talk and patient experience or customer experience or any of these things that happen, we need to look at real talk, real experience. My second message is this one. We are pushed and pulled around by language far more than we realize and we don't know because we don't look. So I am a psychologist by background, and we know from psychology, or we think we know, that people behave in the way they do because of things like their, their personality, or their culture, or their age, or their gender, or their medical history, or all of those factors that we think are driving people's behavior. And the thing is, they might be. But let's put all of that to one side for a moment, and let's think about what people are actually doing. 
which is very often talking to each other. And if we only think about all of those factors that we kind of know about already, then we don't bother to look at what is happening inside an encounter. So let's come back to police negotiators and, and suicidal persons in crisis and the anonymized voices of this moment in a crisis negotiation, whereby the negotiator's job is to keep the person in crisis taking turns. Because every time the person in crisis takes a turn, they're not jumping. They're staying alive every single time. And so in a negotiation, which is a huge, long interaction, you need to think about every single, if you like, pass of the ball from, from conversationalist to conversationalist, or on, on my football analogy, from player to player to player. As soon as, as soon as one person doesn't manage to pass the ball to the next player, then, then the whole th set piece is broken. And it's the same kind of thing here. So here is that line again. Can we talk about how you are? And now you're going to see the transcript coming out in the way that I would produce them um, without the comic bubbles. Can we talk about how you are? And what comes next is seven-tenths of a second of silence, which doesn't sound very long, but in my world it's quite long. And it's enough to tell me that it's unlikely to get a yes or a positive response. So seven-tenths of a second of a delay tells me that the person in crisis is going to respond negatively to this, which is what you know. However, as the no, I don't want to talk, comes out, I want you to particularly listen for the way the word talk is produced. Because even through the anonymized voices, you should be able to hear that it's produced with kind of quote marks around it. No, I don't want to talk. No, I don't want to talk. OK, now, this is also really gorgeous and interesting about interaction. And that is that we think that this person in crisis will talk because they either kind of intend to or they don't, because of all of those factors and variables that we mentioned earlier. And we don't really believe that people are going to be pushed around by language because we just don't kind of believe it. We don't take it seriously enough. There's something else which is really interesting about this, which is that the negotiator is asking to talk. Now, we're going to see something very quickly in the next clip whereby the person in crisis is going to start to talk, but not in response to an invitation to talk, in response to an invitation to where this sounds a bit like talk, but it's not the one that they're trained to use. Also, if it was obvious that the word that I'm going to show you next was the thing that was going to work, then everyone would use it and no one would get it wrong. So these things are not obvious. Because if they were obvious, I wouldn't be able to find the things that I'm going to show you now. So here comes a different negotiation, negotiator talking to person in crisis. And Unlike the delayed response here, whereby we get a negative response, which is delayed, in this case, the negotiator is going to ask a question, and the person in crisis is going to start talking, not even like with a second or a tenth of a second between turns, but before the negotiator has even produced the end of the thing that they want them to do. Oops, and there's the, there's the hang up there. Okay. I want to come down and I want to speak to you. And see you all all so, it turns out that me and my colleague, Ryan Sickfilland, observed these in our materials and then went digging through the rest of the data set and found that when negotiators ask or propose to speak to the person in crisis, the person in crisis starts talking. But when they ask them to talk, the more obvious kind of word to use, they are resisting the, the activity. And they resist it in sort of idiomatic ways. What's the point in talking? Talking doesn't do anything. And they, the idioms fly in at the point where you ask someone to talk. Whereas we don't say things like, actions speak louder than speak, or what's the point in speaking? We don't have that same way of resisting speak than we do the word talk. And like I say, this is not obvious. If it was obvious, we wouldn't ever say talk in this situation. And we'd find that the word speak is in the training guidance and not the word talk. So this takes me on to my third point which is that what we know about talk may not appear in communication guidance or assessment. And, well, let, let's, let's see some examples of this in practice. So now we, we move a bit closer to your world. And this is a study that I conducted some years ago with colleagues at UCL, where we were looking at how do doctors initiate decision-making in neonatal intensive care. So here are the two ways in which we identified doctors initiating this decision-making conversation. Of course, a very difficult conversation, a high-stakes setting like the crisis negotiation. So one way to do it is to make a recommendation framed in the best interest of the baby. And of course, no one's going to disagree that we shouldn't be acting in the best interest of a baby. However, it turns out that articulating and verbalizing that phrase, best interest, 
can lead to all sorts of problems along that unfolding racetrack. So here comes um, some just, I'm, I'm just really keeping it quite short, moments from one type of conversation in which the decision making has been initiated as a recommendation. We need to make sure what is the right thing for this baby. Okay, and again, heavily anonymized voices. We need to make sure what is the right thing for this baby. So there's the best interest. And this is what the mother says in response. So what are my options? Give me some options. That's what the mother wants. And this is the response now from the doctor immediately next. And as the response comes out, just notice what is not being provided. The patient has asked for options. And what comes out is a, another turn initiated by the word so. And this, by starting a new term with the word so, you basically delete the fact that that mother ever asked for options. So what I think what we should do now is uh, we shouldn't make any further intervention. And it's recommendations like this in the best interest of the baby that lead to lines like this. However, there's another way of doing it. And again, this is, is so important to understand what it is that me and colleagues like me around the world try to do with our analysis. And that is, we all know good communication. We think that we've got expert colleagues. So what is it that expert colleagues are doing? Why aren't we learning from looking at people who are really good at their job and then building our guidance and assessment up, up from, from the ground. So here is the other way of doing it that we found, which is to list options, but without articulating best interest. And that doesn't mean that you're not acting in the best interest, but you don't articulate it. Like whether just mass ventilation, suction, mass ventilation, oxygen, or putting the tube into the breathing pipe and breathing and pumping the heart and giving the medicine as well. So here's a bunch of options, including putting the tube in, and then uh, here is the response from the father. So what we found was that recommendations framed as best interest makes two things possible. A recommendation can be accepted or rejected. So it was either passively accepted, which wasn't in the spirit of the, the program, which was to try and get parents to share decision making, or it was resisted and challenged, leading to kinds of lines that you never want to appear on that roadway conversation. However, when options are listed, so when the decision is framed as a list of options and best interest is not mentioned, then it creates slots for discussion, making questions, and reduced friction, collaborative conversation. So here is something that we now know. Is it in the guidance? Probably not. And yet, conversation analysts have shown actually in medical and healthcare settings of many kinds how robust this observation is that recommendations are problematic, option listing is better. And of course, you can kind of scaffold and shape which options find themselves into that option listing, but this is more effective when it comes to shared decision making, if that's what you're after. Okay, my final point then is that humans cannot simulate being other humans. And I do realize that is contentious, maybe, in this room, but what the hell. Uh, <laughs> I thought I would try to you know, keep, you, keep you awake and alive and a bit angry, maybe, uh, in the afternoon. So human beings cannot simulate being other humans. Why am I interested in this particular issue? Well, it's because I deliver lots of training to organizations, having done the research that I've done, and then I want to show them the kinds of things that are effective and less effective. And sometimes I find myself up against um, other types of training, which is basically role play. And so seven or eight years ago, I decided I was going to have a look, and um, as far as I'm aware, I was the first person to do this at the time, at here's the real interaction. I actually looked at police interviewers interviewing suspects. Um, and here's the simulation where the police officers are interacting with actors playing the part of suspects, trying to pass a test so that they can interview the next level of hardcore criminals. So that was the situation. And I started to show all of these differences in really un unimagined kind of ways. For example, introducing yourself. So you have to introduce yourself by law at the start of a, a police interview. And it turned out that the people in the simulation did it rather differently, in a rather controversial way, by saying, my name is, in the simulation, being inspected for doing it. Whereas in the real practice, they said, I'm PCX. And then other colleagues have found sim similar kinds of things subsequently in other settings, in including in GP patient consultations, where in the real consultation, it's I'm Dr. X, but in the simulation, it's my name is Dr. X. Maybe you think it doesn't matter. I think it's, these things do start to matter, though. So let me show you um, 
a different situation. I'm not going to show you the, the medical stuff, um, but I'm going to show you a different type of setting, which is clients and then simula simulated clients phoning the vet. So here is somebody phoning the vet. Okay? Again, not very hard to understand. I, I got this um, puppy the other day. Just wondering how much it costs to get the job done, please. Okay, so you can ask yourself and guess as to whether you think this is a real caller or a simulated person who doesn't really have a puppy. And here's another one. Hello, I wonder if it's possible to make an appointment for my cat tomorrow for a follow-up um, if you've had an operation? Okay, the first one is a mystery shopper. It's someone who is a simulated client. And of course, the job of a mystery shopper is to phone an organisation, have an experience and then report back to the organization about how effective the receptionist, the salesperson, the medic, whoever it might be, the pharmacist, how effective were they? The second one is a real caller who really does have to make an appointment for their cat tomorrow because they've had an operation. Now, when you just see a one-off, you can't really see the difference. But when you look at a large data set, you start to notice that mystery shoppers only call to find out about the price or the process of a service. They don't phone up to make an appointment. They don't phone up to cancel an appointment. They don't phone up upset and concerned about their animal. They don't know the name of their animal. They don't know the weight of it, and they don't know the breed. So <laughs> what we have here is that the mystery shoppers go and report back to the organization and say what? They haven't given the authentic tasks for the receptionist to have to fulfill in service, which is navigate the appointment system, do, be sympathetic to the ill dog, those kinds of things. And of course, you might think, well, this, again, maybe it doesn't really matter, but it does matter because these people are feeding back to the organization and basically saying, that receptionist isn't very good. On what basis? There are some really interesting studies of, of pharmacy using the mystery shopping methodology in which a pharmacist will report, for example, uh, sorry, the mystery shopper will report of the pharmacy that we go in, we pretend to be a patient, we ask for a drug, and the pharmacist doesn't tell us all the things that you're meant to tell somebody on giving them that drug. But what isn't asked at all is, yeah, but how did the mystery shopper actually ask for the drug? Did they ask it in the way that a real customer with a real stake in getting that drug asked it? And it's completely absent in the analysis. There are other bits and pieces in here which are interesting to me, maybe less not to you, but I think they are. And that is things like this. So this is the point at which human beings really can't simulate each other. And that is that the mystery shopper is more likely to use the indefinite article to refer to a dog, whereas somebody with an animal is more likely to use the possessive pronoun and refer to my cat. Maybe it doesn't matter, but it does matter because it builds that sense of this is an authentic inquiry or not. And as I've also put in the circle here, the mystery shopper is more likely to stumble over the fact they've got a d uh, puppy or not, whereas it's normal to stumble in talks and in your, in, and, and, like I'm doing now. So here, my cat, but they don't typically stumble by producing my cat. Instead, the real caller is more likely to stumble when they talk about the type of service that they're after. Okay. So here's a nice quote from Sarah Atkins et al., who did the GP study that I mentioned earlier. Um, and what they're basically saying is, OK, simulation and role play, it's good for practice. But it's probably quite important to not rely on simulation as a proxy for what people, A, might do in real life. And the other problem is that I found with the police interview work, the, the real police interviews and, and the interviews with actors playing the part of suspects, is that in the simulation, the police officers were basically you know, driving along with the, with, the, with the examiner there, making sure they could see everything they're doing, or this sort of conversational equivalent of that, which is I'm going to turn everything in the guidance into a very exaggerated version of it uh, so that you can see it and, and, pass, and pass me. And then even more important, that the practices in the training were not necessarily the effective practices. So then you have this weird circle of the police officers making sure that they can be seen to do the things in the guidance, which aren't really things that work, but they have to do it to pass the test. And then they go and do something else because they're great communicators in real life. OK, so my final example is where this might all go, given that we are moving into a, computer, a computationally augmented world, and AI, I'm sure, is, is not far away from communication in healthcare as well. Let's have a look at my dad ordering pizza with an Alexa. I'd like to order a pizza for delivery. Why, I, he's a Geordie. 
So the top search result for the pizza is Kitchen Craft Masterclass Nonstick Pizza Crisp Tray for Oven. Would you like to buy it? Okay. He didn't want to buy it, but my point in showing you this is I'm going to now show you this request to order pizza in another setting just to show you how far away we are from really understanding talk and how important it is to really understand what people are doing when they're talking. 911, operator 901, where's the emergency? 127, bring me. Okay, what's going on there? I'd like to order a pizza for delivery. Okay, so some of you laughed at this point, but you're not going to laugh in a minute when you see where this is going. And of course, where this is going is it's not about the pizza. It might be about the pizza, but this one is not about the pizza. And so I just want you to notice the gorgeous ability of this dispatch to listen. We all think listening is really important as well until it means, what does it really mean to listen? And see if you can spot the point at which the dispatch starts to figure out this is not about the pizza. And it's, it's, it's partly about the words. And so Alexa was a long way from figuring out that I'm going to order a pizza and I want you to send the police and save my life. Um, but also it's about how talk really is, which is the precise point at which people overlap each other and delay and not between turns. Ma'am, you've reached 911. This is an emergency line. Uh, large with half pepperoni, half mushroom. So just note on line 13 to 14 there, the little overlap, and you're going to see another one where you really start to get it at the end of the call. Is everything okay over there? Do you have an emergency or not? Yes. And you're unable to talk because... Right, right. Is there someone in the room with you? Just say yes or no. Okay, so my take-home message is in reverse order. Number one, humans can't simulate being other humans. Number two, what we know about talk rarely finds its way into communication guidance assessment or AI. We are pushed and pulled around by language more than we realize. And if you want to understand talk, we should study real talk. Thank you. Thank you. No, you can okay. sit down. We're going to find out what's been happening on Twitter. Okay. Thanks, Becky. Oh, there's been a lot of talk about talking <laughs> and, and how we phrase things and the importance of, in particularly in shared decision making. Um, there's been one question from Emily Pascoe um, wanting to know if adolescents respond to words like talk and speak in the same kind of way that adults do, and kind of particularly in regards to performing heads assessments and how we talk to our adolescent patients. Um, I think it's important to be, think about the context in which we are studying these things, given that I'm finding such fine-grained differences and precision things about, about words um, that I don't know about teenagers. I have to say I never study children or teenagers. Um, I don't know why. Um, what I have found is that for this particular distinction between talk and speak is that it is... Um, it, it, it leads to, talk is the, leads to the same kind of resistance in services where, if you like, people see talking as not really doing anything to help them out. So, for example, in mediation services where I've done a lot of work, um, when mediators offer mediation as something that will involve them talking to their neighbour, their partner, their workplace colleague, people resist it in the same kind of way that they do in, in a crisis because they see it as not really doing anything. So that's where the distinction seems to be um, in terms of talking people. If people are, can see it as not really doing anything, then they might resist your attempts to get them to talk in those terms. No other questions? Does anyone in the room have any questions? Because I think we have roving mics. You just raise your hand. Are we seeing anyone? Yes, we have someone at the front. Do we have a microphone? I can repeat it. Oh. Um, hello, my name is Laura. I'm a management assistant from Poland. I was wondering if you could, uh, there was a good example there of how we might train for community, and I was wondering, do you know of any uh, easily accessible resources that we could look at as management clinicians or of, of examples of good ways to speak or more effectively? So Laura is an emergency physician from Scotland and she's asking whether Liz knows of any resources that we might be able to access that will help us in our learning. Well, it, I, this is a terrible thing to do really, isn't it? But I have written a book. It's a popular science book. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great idea. <laughs> and I didn't put it on the slide, but I, I was so excited to see it in foils this morning. <laughs> yeah. 
you very much for the insight you provided. Here's the microphone. <laughs> Thank you very much for the insight you provided about the art of talk. We've been taught years ago at the end of uh, a dialogue with patients or relatives to say any questions. And a few, few years later, the research said, oh, this is like ending the consultation to have questions. And we were taught to use, have you got something to ask? Yes. To prompt more. Has this phrase got worn out by now? Is there a new one, or can I continue using that one? <laughs> I think you can continue using that one, because I think myself and my, my colleagues who wrote that paper, if only we were that powerful that everyone now knew that. Um, I think that's not the case. And actually, we just know that um, the grammar, again, is just kind of constraining your response in that moment, and we see it in lots of different settings. So keep saying something if you actually want them to say more, but if you actually want to sound like you're asking them for more but not really wanting people to say more, then just say anything. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Liz. We have one more question, Henry, just in there. Thanks again for the talk. Um, I know you're talking about um, artificial intelligence and talking about Alexa and things like that. Um, do you think that as the next generation grows up talking to artificial intelligence all the time, that that influences the way that they digest or they talk to other humans as well? Um, I guess it must be, uh, and, and, it, and I mean, I'm hoping that actually my career is over before I have to really try to address that question, because it seems quite complex. I, what I do know is um, I've actually spent the last four or five months working in a company which is one of these Silicon Valley type of companies, and what is interesting is how far away we are from actually being able to produce conversational agents that do authentically produce what we do as humans and, and kind of understand the pragmatics of interaction. Um, I think we tend to get scared of new technologies without thinking about the new technology that was the pen or the telephone. Or, or we t and we also make quite sort of big distinctions erroneously, I think, sometimes between, let's say, writing and the, the, the medium. In the end, I think people are going to need to do things for a long time. They're still going to need to request things. They're going to need to offer to do things. They're going to need to flirt with each other. They're going to need to do actions. And we have more resources for doing those actions, but we're still going to need to do them for a while. 